uh, let's get started. So I've already on. I've got up here. You guys can't see it online, but this is a lockpick training kit. So this is uh, this is John's John Harmon, our VP of operations. Uh, so if you want to see what a lockpick, so in here you'll see. And we'll get to this. You see that you know the tumbler. You see the pins. You see the shear line. You know it's lining up the shear line, the pins with the shear line, which allows the, it to turn. Uh, and then there's rakes and stuff up here. So we can, when we get there, you feel free to take a look at them. They're kind of cool. You can buy one of those online for, I don't know what he paid, less than 50 bucks at Amazon. You know, on Amazon, you can, if you're into that. If you're into that stuff, right. Yeah, you don't want to carry them with you. They are, uh, yeah, some places it's illegal. All right, so today, uh, fuel up. I've got three, like I said, I've, some of you already heard this, but I have three Red Bulls here and uh, water because we're going to get through 179 slides tonight. Last Thursday was like Sleepsville, USA. Today we're going to go fast. Try to keep it high energy. I'll try to speak less monotone. I'll use voice inflection. Keep you guys awake, but we got a lot to get through tonight. Uh, so this is, this is actually a slide from last year, right? So the last week wasn't just an anomaly. It's always like that. That it's just a tough one to teach because it's so uh, theoretical. It's not very practical. It's hard. It's hard to get through that. So these are what we talked about last Thursday. We talked about security models. You remember Bella Padula, Biba, Clark Wilson, Chinese Wall, all that good stuff. Uh, we talked about evaluation methods, certification, uh, accreditation, right? The Rainbow Series, I, and then also ITSAC, common criteria. What's really used today, I think, more than any of those, and I was talking after class, is ISCA, IS, ICSA, which is a certification labs that tests uh, equipment and, and things and give some security uh, certification. Um, and then the difference, you're going to need to know this for the test, the difference between certification and accreditation. I've covered it twice, I'll cover it again. The difference is certification is checking off something against a standard or against uh, some documented requirements. Accreditation is the acceptance of the owner that it met the certif you know, that it met the standard. So certification and accreditation are two, totally, you know, related but different things, and that will be on the exam. Uh, secure system design concepts. We talked about that. Secure hardware architecture. That was, you know, that was sort of about the time we were falling asleep on Thursday. And then uh, the operating system and software architecture. And like I was saying earlier, this used to be so last week or last Thursday, tonight, uh, where we talk about encryption and physical security, those used to be three separate classes. So we condensed encryption and physical security into tonight. That's why it's so much for us to cover. I'll point out the key things for the exam. We're not going to go deep into any one part of this. We could talk about one encryption algorithm for weeks, you know, let alone getting through all of this in two days. So just the things you need to remember for the exam and kind of where you'd use it. We'll talk about those things. Uh, so tonight, this is uh, what we're covering, virtualization, distributed computing. I'm going to go through that really quickly. System vulnerabilities, threats, and countermeasures. I'll talk about that really quickly. A countermeasure is a control meant to prevent uh, either the way threats and threats compromise vulnerabilities that leads to the likelihood and impact that risk equation thing. The countermeasures are control, right, to protect against the threat, sometimes to cover the vulnerability. Uh, the important thing in that is uh, we're going to cover those again, right? You'll see some some common threads in common domains. You'll start to see, you know, uh, in the book where we'll talk about threats and countermeasures you know, kind of at the end of each chapter, pretty consistently now. Uh, cornerstone cryptographic concepts. So we'll need to know the difference between asymmetric, symmetric algorithms and hashing algorithms and how they work. Uh, really important things there. History of cryptography, which is kind of the fascinating part. You can spend a lot of time. There's movies that have been written about, uh, you know, encryption and how it's saved wars and lives. And I mean, it's really, really fascinating if you dig into encryption. The one book, if you really want to, you know, have a deep dive, you know, introduction to encryption. Probably my favorite book is uh, Applied Cryptography, written by Bruce Schneier. That's a really good book if you want to dig in a little bit. That guy knows his encryption. 
Uh, but we'll talk about history of cryptography, types of cryptography, that's symmetric, asymmetric, and uh, hashing algorithms. Cryptographic attacks, uh, I had a question uh, that came in between Thursday and today about uh, the different types of attacks, you know, uh, uh, ciphertext, plain ciphertext, chosen ciphertext, or chosen plain text, those go both. You can do chosen plain text or chosen ciphertext. You can go uh, known plain text, known ciphertext. So we'll get through all that stuff tonight. Implementing cryptography, so how would I use it? Where would I put it? You know, what does it do, what does it not do? And then we're gonna get into physical security, uh, which is the easiest part, I think, of the exam to relate to, but it does require us to uh, memorize some things. We were just talking, you know, five minutes ago about, you know, the A, B, C, D, and K, you know, fire extinguisher agents and where I would use them and all that kind of stuff. We'll need to memorize that. Uh, so we'll get through all this tonight. I'm going to go fast. So virtualization, uh, we talked last week about where virtualization typically sets. And one of the things we referenced was a, a virtualization uh, ring minus one. So remember, we had ring zero, ring one, ring two, ring three. Really, in practice, it's just ring zero and ring three that are really used. Ring zero is for the operating system. That's kernel mode. Ring three is user land or user mode. Uh, virtualization kind of sits between the operating system and the hardware, right? It mediates all those requests. It allows us to run multiple operating systems on the same hardware. There's two different types of uh, virtualization. Uh, you've got transparent, or sometimes it's recalled uh, or referred to as full virtualization. That doesn't. That's where I could run Windows. I can run uh, you know, Linux uh, out of the box operating systems. It doesn't require uh, the operating system modification at all. Now, para virtualization means I need to change the operating system uh, because it sits it sits lower. Uh, the operating system actually has to play well with the other operating systems, right? What you see in in 99.9% .9 of all the installations is transparent or full virtualization, or like, like a VMware ESX system or a, you know Microsoft virtual. Uh, I don't even know what they call it anymore, uh, but it's stock operating systems. No changes to the OS. So that's virtualization. The reason why this became a big issue is because we're running out of data center space, right? As you added more capacity, you added more servers. When you added more servers, that was more use in rack space, which ended up making data centers huge. Then we collapsed everything into this virtualization. We also had blades came about this same kind, same time. Uh, that was to reduce the footprint, but then we, we contributed to heat issues. So then you started seeing you know, a lot of HVAC system changes and whatever. But that's why virtualization became such a big deal. It's a more efficient use of you know, system hardware. The hypervisor, that's the mediator between uh, the software, between the operating system and the hardware. Uh, so it controls the guest operating systems. Uh, there's two types of hypervisors. There's, there's type one, uh, which is part of the operating system, and type two, which is an application. So type one is what we're used to running servers on. Type two is what we're used to running if you were going to run a virtual uh, environment on your laptop, you know, for instance, we, we might do that, you know, pen testing. Uh, we might run VMs or if we're testing uh, uh, malware, right? We get a piece of malware and we want to see how it operates. We'll test it in a VM environment. So it's not going to compromise anything that's real. We can just spin up a new one. Uh, but type one, type two, type one is part of the operating system, runs on host hardware. Uh, type two is an application. Questions? Easy enough. That's about all you need to know. For virtual, well, some more. <clears throat> lower hardware costs, lower power costs, smaller footprint. Those are the benefits of virtualization. Um, security issues, it is more complex. In general, complexity is the enemy of security. So as I add more things, more layers to things, it gets harder and harder to secure. Uh, so far in, in virtual environments, it's been, um, I think, generally, pretty well built, you know. Uh, there's rarely uh, vulnerabilities in hypervisors, right? Theoretically, a compromise of a hypervisor could give you access to the operating systems as well. Uh, but they've, there's only theoretical attacks that I've read about. I've never seen an actual attack in, in the real world on hypervisors. Uh, but it's, it's also easy to bring up new systems. I can spin up a new system. Sometimes well, the way we used to do vulnerability scanning is we'd give you an option either, you know, we'll bring a scanning laptop or spin up a VM and we'll install our, you know, we use Nessus typically for vulnerability scanning. 
will install Nessus on it and things like that. They would just spin it up for us. I doubt it met any specific hardening standards. So that's that's a vulnerability. You know, ease of use, convenience sometimes is counter to security also. Uh, yeah, and if we did have a, if there were a vulnerability, a significant vulnerability in the hypervisor, the, like I said on the last bullet point, theoretically it could access the operating systems. Questions? Easy. Uh, there was a question, it was, oh, she's not here today. See, we scared her away. The gamers are still with us. I mean, like the people that are in it to win it, I said. So, you know, you're 61 people online. There's still quite a few here. I'm actually surprised we haven't had more attrition, but the, the ones that are in it to win it are the ones that are still here. So that's you guys. Pat on your back. And more Red Bull. All right, so cloud computing, this is a big deal nowadays. Now we don't go deep into cloud computing in the, in the uh, CISSP exam. There are specific certifications for cloud computing, uh, but there's been a big move to cloud computing. I can recognize uh, economies of scale. Uh, rather than me having to install my own exchange server, get somebody who's qualified to run that exchange server, maintain that exchange server, patch it, update it, all those things. Now I can just get Office 365 and just offload all that stuff to the cloud, right? Now there's some, there's some give and take in those things. Uh, for the exam, you'll need to know the different types of cloud services. So there's three. Uh, there's IA, IAAS, PAAS, and SAAS, right? Software as a service is the easiest, uh, you know, like um, what's uh, salesforce.com is a software as a service, right? Everything is maintained at Salesforce. All I get is really the application and the application interface or API. Uh, the platform as a service uh, where I have a pre-configured operating system, everything else above that, I install myself and maintain myself. And then there's infrastructure on the service as a service. And that can be nothing more than a rack and the hardware and everything else I install. I can install the operating system. I install everything up from that in the stack. Makes sense. So much computing horsepower uh, at the client. So I can get cheaper computers, you know, less memory, less processor. Uh, that's one type. Uh, diskless workstations, we don't see these, as, you know, as much. Uh, really has the CPU, the memory, and the firmware. No disk drive, no data storage uh, locally. So when it boots up to its boot sequence, it's BIOS post, and then it loads the TCP IP protocol stack. Uh, two protocols that could be used within TCP IP or boot P or DHCP kind of depends on how it's configured. Boot P is, uh, it's really meant to get an IP address so that I can communicate on the network and then initiate uh, either an image download or whatever uh, to that diskless workstation. And then DHCP, as soon as everything runs out of memory <clears throat> on the diskless workstation or the client system. Do you remember uh, uh, mainframes, terminals? You, you know, virtual terminals, yeah, wise terminals. Um, it's funny because back in the day, <clears throat> everything was that and then there was this huge explosion for distributed computing. Everybody was putting in file servers everywhere. You're starting to see kind of a collapse now, I think more you know, trying, everybody trying to bring it's it in cyclical. again. Yeah, it's cyclical and eventually everybody will want more control again and it'll go out back out again. But we're in kind of, I think, the the bringing it in a little bit. But discus workstations are an attempt on that. And then thin client applications. Thin client applications are typically browser-based for the exam. They're all browser-based. Runs on a full PC. There's some examples. Citrix, uh, open thin client, and so on. Essentially, what you're opening uh, the application, everything runs on the server, on the centralized system, and you're just an interface to it. Cool. IoT, bad, right? We all saw the whole IoT thing. Uh, these are trivial system. I mean, every, it's just nuts. Uh, there's really no security in a lot of the IoT devices, and even if there were, people are setting them up with default usernames and passwords because they're so enamored by their refrigerator ordering milk for them that, you know, they just can't even come, you know, oh, I gotta log in and change the password. So, or the, the door, locks. Yeah. door locks, right, There's yeah. That DDoS. Yeah, the massive DDoS, all, all IoT. IoT, they took down Cloudflare. Yeah. Yeah, so it's a, IoT's a security nightmare. 
us as practitioners, I don't know what we can do. Scan our own networks to ensure that we're not contributing to the problem. Uh, but you know, it's hard to it's hard to stop Sally from ordering milk. You know, <laughs> it's just I don't know what you do. You could go. I mean, truly, you could go to a full a whitelist implementation as opposed to a blacklist. So blacklist is everything is allowed unless I specifically stop traffic. If you go to a full whitelist, I only allow permitted traffic. I start with nothing. And I, that, that's the right way to do it, but who's going to do it? Nobody. Me, maybe. All right, so emanations. Uh, so emanations are electrical, uh, electromagnetic uh, uh, inter EMI interference. Um, and you can tell what's going on with the computer system. You didn't need some sophisticated equipment. Uh, potentially to in order to tell what's going on in my computer um, but it would it would read the electromagnetic interference from my display potentially uh, your computer the the um, everything that draws electricity also has that you know capability so pretty sophisticated <coughs> energy escapes from an electronic system tempest is a standard so for the test tempest is a standard uh, and it's a standard for protection against uh, emanations shielding standards uh, they're all they are all classified because it's I guess a really big deal uh, but three levels are public you don't have to know what the three levels are if you do want to know what the three levels it's a B and C uh, and then there's specific shielding requirements for different types of electronic uh, emanations you don't have to know any of that stuff but you do need to know tempest you need to know what it's what it's used for uh, you know what it protects against protects against covert channels covert channels are any any method of communication that goes against policy right policy that's enforced in the computer system itself or policy that's written it's what's policy states what's permitted uh, anything beyond that is a covert channel two types for the test storage channels and timing channels Storage channels are using, uh, like I used the example last Thursday about, you know, temp files are one of the most common covert storage channels. World writable directories and Unix systems is another. Uh, but things, the applications write to specific locations in my operating system. If it's not coded correctly or securely, it could be writing to a place where other people have access to it. And if I access it through that other channel, that's a covert channel. Uh, timing channel is an inference attack. An inference attack is basically uh, a gather enough information to infer or enough valid information to infer what's going on with the system. Uh, you can use that with uh, clock signals. It's pretty sophisticated. Here's an example, though, of one that um, is was announced yesterday or today. What's the date? The 11th. Okay. So it was announced today. This one's sort of interesting, and what it's using is the sensor in your phone and how you tilt it to read what your pin is. So when you type your pin, you have a pattern to how you're typing your pin, and so it's picking up on that pattern, and it 100% effective, I think, after four tries. So that's an example of a side channel attack. The thing is you have to visit a website and download uh, a Java uh, script. To do it so just stay away from javascript i guess but that's an example of a side channel attack and that wouldn't be a storage channel or a timing channel it'd be a different channel but it's still would that be similar covert. to somebody stealing uh badge cards are they sit in the same proximity and somebody somebody stealing a badge card yeah is you know looking into their building sure and somebody sitting there and they can steal that Oh, the yeah. yeah, for 300, yeah, about 300 bucks you can buy, create one of those. Uh, yeah, that'd be, that'd be a side channel attack. Yeah, so the question was uh, compromising somebody's RFID uh, badge, getting that information, creating a duplicate badge, and then badging in yourself. 